Hey, good morning, Lake Merced. I am so thankful to spend this time with you a little bit this morning. So there was this conversation that, that seemed to happen with some regularity in my home when I was a teenager. Uh, I'm wondering if it might sound familiar to any conversations you've heard over the years, but it went something like this. I'd go up to my parents and I'd ask to do something that I wanted to do or have something that I wanted to have. And my parents would sit there and they would listen to me and sometimes they'd say yes, but sometimes they'd say no. Well, no is like the greatest insult there is to a teenager. Why? Because teens have it all figured out. They've assessed their own maturity. They've assessed their own capability, all the risk factors, all the financial implications. And they've arrived at a very simple conclusion that there is no reason on God's green earth why my parents should deny my request. And so no was something like, like throwing the first punch in a fight or launching the first missile in warfare. And it immediately triggered like a full scale response. Uh, but, 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 like, this is so unfair. Why don't you trust me? You know I'm not a little kid anymore. This doesn't make any sense. Why are you trying to ruin my life? Now I can't guarantee that I said those exact words, but I can pretty much promise that I had some version of that conversation with one of my parents at some point in time. I'd, I'd whine, I'd complain, I'd moan and groan. And, and then those famous words would flow out of their mouths with the same dependency as old faithful. Josh, as long as you live in my house, you could probably finish the rest of this statement, right? As long as you live in my house, you are going to follow my rules. It was the ultimate trump card. This is my kingdom and I am the king or queen and you're gonna do as I say. And, and as if it were pre-programmed into me and, and every other teenager who's ever lived, I'd respond with something like, well, maybe I don't wanna live under your roof then. It, it was the only power I had in that moment. I, it was a powerless situation, but as I reflect back on those words or words like them that I spoke and that many, many teens and others have said over the years, I realize now just how much they reveal about human nature, that in our desire for power and control in our lives, sometimes being cut off seems like the only option. Sometimes removing ourselves from the situation seems like the only option that we have. Like I would rather be anywhere than here if here means I don't have the power or the authority that I crave. And in extreme cases, like cut off is exactly where people find themselves. Well, cut off isn't exactly a, a biblical word or phrase, it kinda is, but, but there's a, a word or phrase that, that works a whole lot better. And it's the word exile. If you're a member of Lake Merced, and you've been tuned in with us throughout this pandemic, then you know that, that exile is, is something that we've talked about extensively in our recent sermon series called Captive. It was the, the story of God's people cut off or removed from their normal, from their homeland, and taken into captivity in the foreign land of Babylon. It was a story that in some ways mimicked or mirrored some of the things that we've felt, that we've experienced along the way as we've been cut off from work, cut off from social life, cut off from friends, and constrained largely to the homes that we live in. Well, exile is also the theme this week as we move into week four of our new sermon series that we're calling One Kingdom Indivisible. And even though we, we camped out in exile quite a bit recently, I think it's important that we come back and we revisit this theme again for just this week because God's use of exile isn't limited to only Babylon. Certainly Babylon is the most significant exile story in the Old Testament, but it's most definitely not the only exile story. In fact, exile or, or being cut off from your home is a recurring theme throughout the biblical story. And, and it's recurring because it's a tool in God's holy tool bag that he uses whenever he needs to teach his people a really, really vital lesson. And that lesson is this, that God uses exile when his people claim power for themselves. I'm gonna say that again. God uses exile when his people claim power for themselves. So like, whenever God's people develop a, a habit of relying on their own power or their own ability or their own might, 
God routinely acts in such a way that they are reminded, often painfully, that power was never theirs to possess. So I want to ask you this. How many of you remember the movie Home Alone? Home Alone is a, a classic Christmas movie, at least in my house. It was one I grew up watching. It's one that, that we watch probably every year with my kids. Well, what is Home Alone ultimately about? Well, in the opening scenes, we're introduced to Kevin McAllister, right? A, a kid who's, who's frustrated. He's sick of his family. He's sick of being told what to do. And as he's sent away to go to bed for the night, he looks his mom in the eye and he says, you know, everyone in this family hates me. And she looks at him and says, maybe you should ask Santa for a new family. He says, I don't want a new family. I don't want any family. She says, stay up there. I don't, I don't want to see you again for the rest of the night. And now he's, he's going to hurt her. I don't want to see you again for the rest of my life. You could tell she's hurt a little bit. She looks at him. She says, I hope you don't mean that. You'd be pretty sad if you woke up tomorrow morning and you didn't have a family. And there's this brief moment where he pauses. He kind of thinks about what she's saying. And actually rather sweetly, he says, no, I wouldn't. And as the movie unfolds, that's exactly what happens, right? Kevin wakes up the next morning. He doesn't know what's happened, but he knows one thing. His family is gone, and he finally has all the power. He has all the control. Everything he could have ever wanted is his. And yet, in a matter of a few days, Kevin learns a powerful lesson, that having power and being exiled from his family isn't something to rejoice over. It's something to mourn. It's an effective reminder that when we actually acquire the power that we so often crave, the cost associated with it is profound. It's deep. In fact, acquisition of power may cost you everything good that you already had, but you are blind to. Power is a seductive and deadly trap. And over the past three weeks, we've talked about some key truths in the opening pages of the Bible. Like in week one, we said, why did God create me? Why did God create us? Well, he created me to bless others. You know, from the days of Abraham, that was God's purpose for his people, to bless other people. And so in week two, we said, okay, so what happens when we don't live according to our purpose? Well, we can't live in the unity that God desires for us because we're hoarding blessings with impunity. We're, we're hoarding blessings seemingly without consequence to benefit who? To benefit ourselves. And so nothing destroys unity faster than that. And so in week three, we said, okay, so what does unity that, that God desires for us look like then? Does it mean that everyone just goes around conforming and looking like robots? No, what it means is that God's people are called to be inseparably connected to one another, but yet removed from the ways that the world lives and behaves. In other words, we are called to be set apart together. And so here in week four, the theme of exile brings us to something of a paradox, because on the heels of last week's story of the Exodus, God not only rescues his people from slavery, but he brings them into a promised land, a kingdom to call their own, a kingdom that will eventually be called Israel. And dating back hundreds of years before God revealed part of his plan for them, even to Abraham, God said, hey, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. And I share that because I want you to see that, that God had every intention of Israel being powerful. A powerful Israel is not a bad Israel. A powerful Israel is what God intended for Israel, for his, his chosen and his holy people. So ask yourself this, what does it mean to be powerful or to, to have power? Well, power is, is simply the ability to direct or, or influence the behavior of other people. God absolutely wanted Israel to have the ability to influence the behavior of others. Why? Because it's for his glory. And so as the days of Moses draw to a close, the days of a powerful Israel begin to dawn. First was what we call the conquest of Canaan, where God sets apart this land, this promised land. He's given it to them, but it's not vacant. They have to go in. They have to fight for it. 
And as a way of inaugurating this new frontier before them, God steps in and he stops the flow of the Jordan River, just like he'd done the Red Sea 40 years ago. Almost as if he's like divinely opening the door for them to go in. And they cross over together. And as they do, the text says something interesting. It says that God did this so that all peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. And I want you to go back and I want you to mark that word powerful. In fact, throughout this morning, whenever you see the word powerful or, or read the word powerful, I want you to mark it in the text, highlight it, do something, and keep a pen handy because we're going to be doing a couple of things with pins in this, uh, in this little message here today. And so as the story goes, God's people come in with God by their side and, and they win over the land for themselves. They do it powerfully. They do it decisively. They, they set up this land where, where God is their God and they are his people. And that is the book of Joshua. But by the very next book, the book of Judges, some cracks in that power structure begin to, to emerge a little bit. Now, never mind the, the really important fact that the entire Bible is one big exile account of God's people cut off from the Garden of Eden. But here in Judges, we get the first of several exile stories. In Judges 3, the Bible says that the people eventually forgot God and they went and they served false gods. And so God got angry. He got hurt. And so what did he do? He gave them into the hands of the king of Aram. And for eight years, they were subject to him. In other words, they lived in exile. And from there, a familiar cycle begins to emerge. The, the people cry out from their oppression. God hears their cries he raises up a deliverer for his people, in this case, a man named Othniel, who's called a judge in the Bible. And the text says that the spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave the king of Aram into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. And so the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. I want you to see that phrase. You see that phrase, the spirit of the Lord came on him. I want you to mark that as well, because it's also going to be really, really important in this message. The spirit of the Lord came on him. And so after Othniel dies, comes a judge named Ehud. Why? Well, the people forgot God again, and God gave them over to another king, the king of Moab, for 18 years until Ehud delivered them. And then came Shamgar, who saved Israel from the Philistines for all the same reasons. Then came Deborah, who saved Israel from the king of Canaan after 20 years for all the same reasons. Then came Gideon, who saved them from the Midianites for all the same reasons. And on and on and on this goes for 11 iterations of Judges. God's people forget, they worship other gods, and God gives them over to a period of exile. Over and over and over again, God's people lose sight of the power of God and they become seduced with their own power, wrapped up in their own little worlds. And then patiently, just like I do with my kids, God corrects them and reminds them of his power. Just about the time they realize they were powerless all along. And then the cycle reboots itself time and time and time again. The cycle continues 11 times until there's a shift in the power structure. Because eventually the people develop what they think is an even better idea. They say a king. They think to themselves, hey, everybody has a king. Someone who leads them in battles and tells them what to do. Like, why shouldn't we have a king? Let's have a king. And so God just kind of throws up his hands. He's like, you guys had a king. It was me. And when you had to go to battle, I led you. And when you had to get out of Egypt, I led you. And when you had to go into Canaan, I led you. He led them through 11 cycles of exile with the judges. But essentially, he finally says, hey, if you want a king, fine. But just know this, this king that you covet so much, he's not going to give you anything. You've, you've glamorized him, but he's not going to do anything for you. In fact, he's going to take and take and take and take and take until you have nothing left. So here he is. Here's, here's King Saul. And King Saul came in, but eventually what happened? The power corrupted him. 
So in comes King David, a good king, a powerful king, a mighty king, a warrior king. But eventually what happened? The, the power corrupted him. And then came King Solomon, his son, the wisest man who ever lived. But what happened? Power corrupted him. And so king after king after king, all with great acclaim, all with great enthusiasm, all with great promise that things would be different this time. And in some way, shape, or form, power seemed to find a way to corrupt every single one of them. And all along the way, when God would show up, there was this, this interesting little phrase that keeps appearing in the text. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. It happened in the period of the judges. It happened in the period of the kings. It even happened in the prophets. That in Israel's weakest moments, the moments when they felt utterly powerless, what would happen? The Spirit of the Lord would show up with power and God's people would be rescued from their exile, from their hopelessness, from their weakness, from their powerlessness. Guys, we talked about this. Genesis is about blessings, right? And then the next four books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they're all about holiness. Well, can you guess what the rest of the Old Testament story is about? It's about power. And more specifically, it's a painful reminder over and over and over again about who has the power. That when the people realized that the power was God's, he made them a powerful nation and he blessed them abundantly. They had everything they needed. But as soon as they forgot, as soon as they forgot who he is, man, as soon as they thought the power was theirs, they were reminded just how powerless they really were. And off they'd go into exile. Off they go into oppression. The story of Israel was a story of a fight with a rebellious teenager or, or a Kevin McAllister uh, protesting with his parents again and again and again for hundreds of years. It was that story of people who just couldn't quite understand one central truth with a capital T. And it was a truth that eventually King David got. He, he wrote about this truth in Psalm chapter 62. This is what he said, I should say Psalm 62. He concludes the Psalm this way. He says, one thing God has spoken, two things have I heard. Power belongs to you, God. And with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And you reward anyone according to what they have done. What does he say? He says, power belongs to you. Guys, that is the lesson that David eventually learned, but it's a lesson that, that most every generation seems to find some way to forget. And so exile is God's tool for reminding people who've forgotten or never learned what King David finally did. God had every intention for his holy nation to be a powerful nation. But there's a catch here because every single time that they became one, they forgot what got them there in the first place. Or better yet, they forgot who got them there. They forgot him. And that behavior is, is nothing new. It's something that, that still befuddles psychologists today. They, they call this the paradox of power. And it's, it's not a situation that's exclusive to those people in, in that day. What, what psychologists have realized or learned over the years as they studied people and power is that many times the skills or the talents or the behaviors that help someone rise to power almost immediately disappear once they finally acquire it. I'm going to try to illustrate what I mean. Uh, several years ago, a, a researcher showed up at UC Berkeley with free pizza and a survey, and he began interviewing all these freshmen in the dorms about their perceptions of, of other students that they lived with. And at the end of the year, he, he went back, more free pizza, another survey, and he interviewed a lot of the same people. And, and what he learned was that the people at the top of the, the social hierarchy, the people who'd become more influential, more powerful in that context there, were also the same people who were most kind, most considerate, most agreeable, and most extroverted. 
In other words, it, it wasn't the bullies. It wasn't the people who, who threw their weight around, who rose to power. It was the nice guys. It was the guys who, who, who are kind, who finished first. The guys who did all the right things. But as he kept studying, and not necessarily this instance at UC Berkeley, but just the, the, the issue overall, he, he wanted to know what happens to people who, who do all the right things. Well, he, here's what the, the researcher learned. He said this, and I'm quoting him. He said, it's an incredibly consistent effect that, that when you give people power, they basically start acting like fools. They flirt inappropriately, they, they tease in a hostile fashion, and they become totally impulsive. And so he compares the, the feeling of power to, to brain damage, noting that, that people with lots of authority tend to behave like neurological patients with a, a damaged orbital frontal lobe, a brain area that's crucial for empathy and decision making. He says even the most virtuous people can be undone by the corner office. And so here's a little exercise for you, courtesy of a, of a similar research study that Northwestern University did. So if you have a pen handy, hopefully you do. If you don't, I want you to run and go grab one. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to write the letter E on your forehead. Uh, don't worry, it, it will rub off. And, and don't wait for the, the results. Just write the letter E on your forehead. Trust me with this. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna give you a moment. If you need to click pause on the video, click pause on the video. But write the letter E on your forehead and then come back. And so hopefully you got a chance to do just that. But here's what the researchers at Northwestern found. That those with, with subconscious feelings of their own power, their own superiority, tended to write the letter E in a way that would appear backward to other people because they had written it where the orientation was for who? It was for themselves. And then those who were less concerned with their own power tended to write the E in such the way that it would be read correctly when others were looking at them. So look at your own head. How, how did you do it? The good news is, is you don't have to tell me. So the secret stays with you and, and whoever's in the room with you right now as you're watching this. But however you personally reacted, it is frankly less consequential than the norm because the norm has already shown what people do. The norm has shown that people who acquire power usually do so for the right reasons, but they almost never continue to behave with altruism and with integrity after they've acquired it. And I think this is probably what we see that, that frustrates us the most about politicians and executives and, and other VIP, very important people types our brains seemingly rewire themselves and we no longer behave as we once did. And so basically what we're saying is that psychology demonstrates the, the veracity of that old saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. John, John Steinbeck, the, the famed author from the Monterey area said something else. He said, power doesn't corrupt. He said, fear corrupts. Perhaps the fear of a loss of power, he said. Well, whichever is true, it's likely that God repeated uh, exiling of Israel, right? Or his repeated exiling of Israel or his beloved people was not simply a, a disciplinary act that you did wrong and now you go to time out. It may very well be or have been a decision that was born out, out of deep understanding of the human heart. How do I, God, how do I make sure that my people live according to their purpose? Well, I take away their power to remind them of my own. And so church, this is a series meant to, to not shy away from the difficult conversations that happen in the political sphere around us all around the world right now. And the fact of the matter is that Christianity has had a, a tenuous relationship with power for a better part of 1500 years. You know, for the first 300 years of Christianity's existence, it was largely illegal to be a Christian, it was, it was something that Christians had to be secretive about. In fact, to this very day in countries like China or, or North Korea or some other places, it still is. It wasn't until Constantine, the Roman emperor 300 years after Christ lived, made Christianity finally the state religion, that our faith had any kind of, of position of power or influence in the political world. Nevertheless, the, the pre-Constantine church grew and it prospered 
And it lived out the Great Commission just fine, just like today. And it's doing that still to this day in places like China and North Korea, where the church is incredibly strong. And so, brothers and sisters, what I want you to see is that much of the tension and the heartache that churches all across our land are experiencing as they they process the political climate that surrounds us right now, a lot of that heartache comes from a very similar place of God's people seeking power or control. And what I want you to see is whether Steinbeck is correct or, or whether the researchers at Cal and Northwestern are correct, that it all comes from, from altruism and good motives. Like, all that's almost beside the point. The point is that when the people of God, when the church ever gets to a point where we are angling for power, we're grasping for power, we're seizing for power, we're fighting for power, or trying to acquire power in some way, we are never, ever headed toward anything good. Church, power is God's to give. It is never ours to take. Power is God's to give. It is never ours to take. There's a pastor out of Dallas. You may have heard of him. His name is Robert Jeffress. He just so happens to be a, a spiritual advisor to the president right now. And I want to say this, I have no desire to speak about or endorse any political candidate. I never have. I don't believe I ever will. I participate in the process as a voter. I do not advocate for anybody in, in, this, in this pulpit. But I bring up Jeffress because I want to illustrate the danger of what I'm saying. Uh, in 2016, he did an interview with a conservative radio talk show host, a guy by the name of, of Mike Gallagher. And Jeffress was asked an interesting question. He, He was asked something to the effect of, would you prefer a president who governed according to the principles of the Sermon on the Mount or not? Now, mind you, this is a a pastor of a 13,000 member Baptist church. Would you prefer a president who governed according to the Sermon on the Mount, to Jesus' words? And this is what he said, verbatim, I quote, heck no. I would run from that candidate as far as possible because the Sermon on the Mount was not given as a governing principle for this nation. Government is to be a strong man to protect its citizens against evildoers. I don't care about that candidate's tone or vocabulary. I want the meanest, toughest son of a you-know-what I can find, and I believe that's biblical. Those are his words. If we've gotten to a point as Christians that we explicitly reject the teachings of Christ unapologetically, the man that we call the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, if we get to a point where we're okay rejecting those things, I'm convinced that we risk becoming a people in love with our own power. And what I hope to have demonstrated this morning is that that's never ever a good place for Christians to be. Church, power is God's to give. It's never ours to take. I want to be where the Spirit of the Lord is. Because all throughout the Bible, when the Spirit of the Lord shows up, the Bible shows us that He comes powerfully. The Spirit of the Lord is more powerful than any nation who has ever walked the face of this earth. The kingdom of God is more powerful than any nation that has ever walked on the face of this earth. God can take people and he can make those people mighty with more power than than we could possibly fathom. But power is God's to give. It is never ours to take. In Acts chapter one, the disciples of Jesus, his followers, they gather around him. He's, he's, he's already died. He's always already been buried. He's already resurrected and he's gathering with them. He's just about to ascend into heaven. And they ask him a really, really vital question. They say, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What are they saying? They're saying, Jesus, 
We've been living in exile under one kingdom after another after another for so long. First it was Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, now Rome. Are you going to finally make us powerful again? Can we defeat the empire and restore the kingdom to Israel? Is that what's going to happen now? And what did Jesus say next? The Bible says, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, church, power is coming. But when and how and what it looks like, those aren't for you to know. He says you will receive power, not when you defeat Rome, not when you claim Jerusalem as your home, but when. You receive power when the Holy Spirit of God comes on you. Power is God's to give. It is never ours to take. And so church, we, we already have the, the power because we already have the Holy Spirit of God. That's already ours. And that means it really, frankly, matters little who Caesar is or who the president is or who the Supreme Court justices are. Not to say you don't have a voice, not to say you don't vote, but we don't, we don't, it doesn't matter that much because they're not our king and they don't have our king's power. Our king is what matters. We receive God's power when we receive the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ in our lives. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, baptized into him, then you have inherited a more powerful king and you have received citizenship in a more powerful kingdom. Some of us have the power already and we don't even know it yet. We don't even realize it. God has given it to us. So why are so many of us preoccupied with trying to take it? Guys, power is God's to give. It's never ours to take. And I wanna invite you to receive it today. I want, you, I want you to receive God's power today. I wanna to invite you to receive the love of God into your life today. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you've encountered in your life. But God promises to come into your life powerfully if you will receive him, believe in him, confess your sins, and be baptized into him. David wrote this, power belongs to you, God. And with you, Lord, is unfailing love. That's who God is. He's unfailing love, and he is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. So no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, God's unfailing, matchless, merciful love awaits you to empower you to go and proclaim good news in a world filled with bad news. Will you let God empower you today by the power of his Holy Spirit? We invite you. Please email us at questions at lakemercedchurch.com. We would love to walk with you on your journey of faith in him. God bless you, my friends. We will see you next week.